This process is called dideoxynucleotide DNA sequencing. We have four tubes here. Each of them contains essentially the same stuff. The only difference between them is which of four dideoxynucleotides they contain. One is going to contain dideoxy ATP, one is going to contain dideoxy GTP, the third dideoxy CTP, and the fourth dideoxy TTP. Right? Adenosine triphosphate, guanine triphosphate, or guanosine triphosphate, cytosine triphosphate, thymidine triphosphate. They look like the precursors to DNA, but they are the dideoxys, so if they get incorporated into chains, no further growth will occur at that point. So what are the other things in these tubes? Well, they contain everything else you need to do cell-free replication, to do DNA synthesis in a test tube. So they will contain DNA polymerase. They will contain the four natural deoxytriphosphate, deoxythymidine triphosphate, deoxycytosine triphosphate, and so on. One of them, usually deoxyadenosine triphosphate or deoxyATP, is actually radioactive. In addition, you put into this tube the DNA that is to be sequenced. We call the DNA to be sequenced the template DNA. Dideoxy sequencing is really replication based. Well, what else do you need to make this happen? Well, you're going to need a primer. That is usually a synthetic oligonucleotide that is based on the sequence of the gene that you wish to sequence. So it, it's a sequence you have to know in advance. So you need a primer because DNA replication requires a primer. To summarize, you need all the components necessary to do DNA sequencing based on the known activities of polymerase, the known precursor requirements. One is radioactive, so you can follow it. You need template that's going to be sequenced, and a primer, so that the DNA polymerase can add to the primer in order to do the sequence. And you need to add these dideoxys, one each. That's what makes each tube different. So this is what's going to happen as the DNA is actually synthesized in each tube. So let's imagine we have lots of template. Those are the blue strands. We have annealed a, an oligonucleotide primer to which we're now going to be adding new nucleotide. The sample on the left is in the tube that contains dideoxy A. The tube next to that contains dideoxy C rather than dideoxy A, and so on. So what do you expect is going to happen, say, on the tube on the left? As DNA is synthesized, if you have put the right proportions of ingredients into these tubes, every now and then a dideoxy A is going to be added to the end of a growing chain, and at that point, that chain cannot grow any further. So the idea is that we're just looking at the leftmost example. We will have made, on a random basis, several different length new molecules of DNA, each one extended until the incorporation of one of these dideoxy A molecules. At that point, they can't grow anymore. So we have a distribution of difference within a dideoxy A opposite a T in the template. Let's take a look at the C. So, and in fact, we can look at all of them at once. So dideoxy C fragments are terminated wherever there was a G in the template. And if you did it just right, you get a fair distribution of all the different possible fragments that would terminate where there is a G in the template. If you use dideoxy G, you will be terminating fragments opposite where there is a C in the template. And when this is done, you can get fragments up to seven or 800 bases long, representing every possible G or every possible A or every possible C or T in the template with a cognate or complementary fragment terminated with one of the dideoxys. So now you have all these different size fragments. So what you do is you run a gel electrophoresis of a material from each of these tubes. These are now radioactive, remember, because into each of these fragments a certain amount of deoxy ATP, the normal nucleotide, has been incorporated. So there are going to be radioactive A's in these sequences. And so you can run the gel and then place a piece of x-ray film on top of the gel, expose it, develop it, and you'll get something that looks like this. It's a piece of x-ray film with lots of bands. What's really miraculous, if you want to think about it that way, I, I used to say in classes, this is about as miraculous as a 747 getting off the ground. Each band that you are looking at is separated from its nearest neighbor. This is a length separation, a size separation. Each band is separated from its nearest neighbor by the um, amount of DNA in one nucleotide. And since you can get fragments on a system like this up to 
300 bases long, what we're really saying is when you look at a real autoradiograph, you can see pieces of DNA that differ in length by one nucleotide, in the case of a 300 base long fragment that you're trying to sequence, that means you're looking at distances that are one three hundredth of the entire length of the sequence that you're looking for. Now how do you read a sequence? Well, you actually read from the bottom up. So the sequence, if you look at it on the gel, if you, before I show it to you, would read something like C, G, A, T, G, G, etc. So you read in order of the latter. The first base is a C, that's the lowest one down. The next one up is a G. The next one up after that is an A, and so on. Well, this process is what I used in my lab to do a lot of sequencing in the early days.